Just minutes from downtown Bakersfield lies a fossil deposit 15 million years old. In this week's Science Sunday segment, we take you to Shark Tooth Hill. The way it, uh, it began was the, you know, prior to the Civil War, uh, we had railroad, railroad survey crews coming through the area and looking for uh, uh, a way to tr connect the Transcontinental Railroad. Well, they discovered the fossils at that point and they made note of it, but nothing really took place or happened because of the Civil War was an interruption. And then all of a sudden around 1872, they had finished the Transcontinental Railroad and they were coming back down through the area with a survey crew in 1872. And they had found a note and they went over and discovered the fossils, rediscovered them again. They put the entire survey crew to work for a couple of weeks and uh, pulled out a bunch of fossils, carted them up, and put them back, you know, sent them back on the train on the car over to the East Coast, and they ended up in learning institutions on the other side of the, uh, the coastline. And that's kind of how it began. Those were the first fossils, we believe, found west of the Rocky Mountains. Um, uh, and um, not sure, you know, uh, uh, if they knew exactly what they were doing with them. And the first fossils found by Europeans, obviously. Uh, Indians knew they were here. The Yokuts Indians knew they were here. Um, after that, uh, some work was done up here, but uh, uh, it really didn't take off until after World War II. Um, by that point, uh, in the 50s, people started coming up here day tr for day trips to dig for fossils. And as a matter of fact, on the back side of the property back there, there was even a snack shack. Somebody had built a snack shack and they were selling Coca-Colas and peanuts to people who were coming up here and for day trips to lay in trenches and dig for shark's teeth. Um, and then after that, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, somebody sent me a, a magazine article from 1962. that was from Westways Magazine, which is produced by AAA. And in it, it had, you know, uh, Destination Shark Tooth Hill and you open it up and there's a three page spread in there and in it it had all these people lying around in the trenches digging for shark's teeth they, they all look like they're out of mad men right with the white shirts and the black ties and they're all smoking <laughs> so, right just laying around in the dirt you know and digging for fossils up here and the ladies all had the scarfs and the capri pants and everything and so it was quite an activity all through the 60s um, and then the los angeles county museum started coming up here and doing some of the biggest work up down there on the actual shark tooth hill they had several bulldozer pits that they uh, worked there and did some of the first large-scale excavations in the area. Uh, and that took place throughout the late 60s and the 70s. Then around 1976, um, the, this entire area was owned by Getty Oil. And so Getty Oil decided that they would make a small section and gift it to the Kern Community College District. Well, the uh, BC and Taft College and Porterville College, the college district received this gift of the actual area that's the Shark Tooth Hill, and they went ahead and applied for and got it as an actual national natural landmark. So they got it designated there, and they had it in their possession all the way up until a few years ago. So that's kind of the, 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 the general history. There's a whole lot of stuff that was going on in this area in the 60s and 70s. There's literally up the road a a hippie commune that was around from 67 to around 74 and a grass fire came through burnt down all their structures literally there there there's there's there there's they left their there's all their buildings are burnt down and they left their vehicles all up there and um, they were making pottery because they had pottery shards lining all cobbled all over the walk paths and such so so they were up here and they probably knew they were, <laughs> this stuff was here too um, that in the uh, uh, this particular site we're at right here, this 40 acres, this was owned by a couple um, from 1962 to 1991, I believe. And uh, there was Mr. and Mrs. Shoemaker, and they owned this for quite a long period of time. And they literally would pick the material up in, in, with big chunks and drop it through that old machine we passed back there. You saw that, that old vibrate, that was a vibration machine. So they would pick the fossil bed up and drop it through there. So they literally quarried it for its fossils for about 30 years. Okay. And so that's why we call it a quarry. Just because if you go to that back side, it looks, it's all stepped up. And it looks like this place has been heavily, heavily, and it has heavily been dug up on that back side for a long period of time. And then uh, my dad purchased it from them um, around 91. And then I've been kind of coming up here since then. 
Um, my father passed away in 07, and um, I, through inheritance, received the property, along with my stepmother, uh, Mary Ernst. And uh, she's now um, remarried and moved on, and she's the one that ended up owning all of the fossils down at the, down at the Buena Vista Museum. And so there was a whole history that's right there with uh, her interaction with the museum as well. And they still have lots of the fossils down there, including the, the two large sea lions, Aladesmus, and there's one that's articulated, and then there's one that's still in the matrix down, down below that looks like it's, it's missing its head. Okay. So. That's so cool. And I love that that's California history. And, you know, kids who are just starting to learn about fossils and the dinosaur and millions of years ago, there was this entire different way of life. This wasn't always dry land. No, no. This, we're, we're now at 800 feet roughly above sea level. We were once four, 600 feet below sea level. We've had 1,200 feet of uplift over the last, you know, 10, 12 million years. And this was once an inland sea. The coastlines are defined. One, one's over by Kalinga. Uh, the other one is up in the Tatchby Mountains. Uh, the one over Kalinga, over by Kalinga, was more of a beach where they have shells and, and material that they find that you find closer to the beach. And the one that was over in the Tatchby Mountains, that eastern shoreline, had a bunch of tributary rivers that brought down material to the edge. And so not only did you find the shells and stuff, but you'd find some land animals as well. Some, uh, um, a proto horse that was in, around at the time period. It's a lot of dugong, um, sea cow or manatee type material that was close to the ocean shore, some you know, prehistoric beavers and other things like that. Um, and then as this inland sea went up north, it cut through like where the Monterey, Salinas Valley, all that area was there. And as you got further north, it became more of a marshland. So you get more of like an Everglades kind of material that as it, as it went in there and cut into the sea. And they find everything from saltwater crocodile kind of material up there to other things you do find more Everglades kind of a situation and so it was a really vast inland ocean. Okay and so then as things have dried out and we've had some new material stacking on top of it it's not that deep to find these fossils here. N well the fossil bed itself the strata you see all these hills out here they're all from erosion. The the strata itself is roughly uniform like a flat plain and it runs through all these hills at roughly 800 feet above sea level. It's on a slight south by southwest slope. But for the most part, you can find it hitting all of these hills at that level. So it is true, you walk around the perimeter of these hills and you'll find shark's teeth. But then the, to, get, to get, continue to get more shark's teeth, you've got to start removing more and more of the side of the hill to get to the middle. And that's what's going on behind us here. We've actually gotten to the very middle of this hill. Behind us, this is where we actually engage with a lot of scientific activity and other excavations. Perfect. And tell us about that scientific activity. What are you finding out here? Well, um, we just recently over here on the other side um, worked with the Los Angeles County Museum to pull out a, uh, a new species of sperm whale. And uh, that uh, we took about five weeks in total um, and various you know, times that come up here um, to pull that out. And um, uh, the two uh, amateur uh, people that worked with, that originally discovered it and started doing the majority of the work, we immediately knew, uh, you know, that um, uh, it was something special. So started contacting the Los Angeles County Museum and then got them up here. And then uh, Dr. Lawrence Barnes, who's the curator emeritus down at the LA County Museum, he identified it as, well, this is an animal we've been working on for quite a while, about 30 years based on only maybe five teeth that they had, loose teeth, and now we've got quite a bit of the animal. So he came up and oversaw the excavation of it. Um, you, have to, you have to remove the material, jacket it, pull it out, take it down to the LA County Museum, and they have since started sending me back some of the replicas of it. Um, it's gonna be going through quite extensive peer review for quite a long period of time, just to make sure that it's not some sort of a deformed version of several of the other uh, wells that we already have identified from this time period. So that's the, that's the most current um, situation that's been going on. Um, we've had our local uh, university, CSU Bakersfield, um, working on a wells mandible out there. They've got a fledgling paleontology department out there with Dr. Uh, Rathborn. He, uh, he is the, uh, runs a paleontology uh, department and they've got a few uh, grad students. Uh, come out here, but in the past we've had UC Berkeley come down. UC Berkeley was down here and did a, uh, a study on um, the geological rippling of this area, trying to uh, determine what the, you know, why the fossil bed was so concentrated. 
But at the time Berkeley came down, it was anticipated that this fossil bed was 500,000 to maybe 800,000 years in duration. And so they, 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 that's how they had to come up with a geological reason of, comprac of compression as to why we got so much fossil stacked on top itself. But then later on, we happened to be filming a, a TV show here for the Discovery Channel called Sharkzilla. And we had uh, Dr. Sempaglia, who is with the University of Ohio. He came out here with some interns and they took samples at all these locations, including the other side of the river, at all these different sites. And then they went back and did a microfossil study. And they were able to date this time period far better than the, uh, um, than the potassium um, iodine dating that they were using prior to that, which they could only get within maybe you know, a million years uh, of, of time period. So that's why they were averaging it at 50 million years. And they figured it had only been around for five to 800,000 years. When he did the microfossil study, he determined that it was actually around from 14.6 to 16.2 million years. So you got about a million and a half years of duration. Now you've got enough time for all of that material to stack up, which kind of goes in the way of, you know, what UC Berkeley was, you know, talking about. So unfortunately it kind of, you had one scientific group, you know, uh, uh, determine something that kind of, you know, and then the other guys were like, well, there goes our theory. Contradicted. <laughs> Contradictory. Yeah. Well, that's what yes. I love about the scientific method is it keeps evolving. So oh, yeah. What are some of your uh, biggest discoveries from the public out here? Uh, well, we had um, the public was here, and um, we don't normally um, uh, ever you know let them dig in the actual un completely untouched stuff anymore. Um, there is literally 55 years of material that's been deposited in the surrounding hills here that's been broken up and, and beat up and looked through to a certain extent, but it still contains maybe 30 to 40 percent of its intact fossil bed. It's just been transplanted up into these hills. So they're looking through and on occasion they'll find a megalodon or they'll find, um, you know, a lot of nice stuff. Most of it is material that came out of the seafloor, the fossil bed seafloor, and nothing was articulated. So. When you get down to the ocean floor, and it was a killing floor, it was just literally, it's just littered with, you know, marine, bo you know, whale, sea lions, those kind of dolphins and bony fish, all those fossils mixed in with shark's teeth. And, and every time we've ever found like a full skeleton, they've always been lifted up on top of, of the fossil bed. And so it took some special circumstances for whatever animal that died to not have scavenging activity take place. So we don't ever really worry about the general public finding the important scientific things, but every once in a while they'll run across some stuff. Um, this one, I one case, a little boy came and this, his dad brought it over to me and, I was, and they said, you know, what do you, what do you think of this? And I was like, well, I don't know what that is. It's a piece of jaw that had three teeth in it and didn't know what it was. So I took it, <laughs> thinking <laughs> I'll have somebody look at it. And I sent it actually to uh, um, UC Berkeley and um, they were looking at it up there, and then I contacted them. I said, like, "What did you ever figure out?" That I said, "Oh, the saltwater crocodile." It's like, "Oh, way down here. Cool. You hardly ever find that stuff down here." But that's the kind of stuff that you know we'll pull out, and if someone sees something like that, we might be able to grab it. Otherwise, you know, they're they're free to take home most of the stuff. And the megalodons, they're special, but at the same time, they're not, you know, they're not scientifically valuable unless they're massive, unless they're like the six or seven inch kind. Um, but we found like 22 megalodons last year. So the public got to pick, find 22 megalodons and take them home. But uh, I always tell this because everybody that finds a, a meg up here, they take pictures of it. You know, they put it on Facebook and Instagram and it's all over. And then the next people that come up here go, I want to get my megalodon, right? And I have to explain to them that like, yeah, we found 22 last year, but I had 1,480 people up here over the course of the entire year, including large school groups and everything else. So your chances of actually finding a megalodon are slim to none, and I've never met anybody who specifically was coming here to find their megalodon that have found their megalodon. It's always some young kid that's looking and they're just having a great time and they're finding lots of things, and then they, it pops out at them. Cool. And then you have people that have been coming here for decades, throwing their shovels down and 
kicking, you know, the dirt and saying, never going to come back. <laughs> and it's not like digging for dinosaurs, like you were mentioning earlier when we were talking about Utah. You're not out here with a little brush getting this huge skeleton. It's the public doing buckets of sand, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about them, yeah, looking through the material that's already been, you know, deposited up into these hills for the last 55 years. They still find plenty of large shark's teeth. We found just last week, we didn't find a megalodon, but this one lady found a sea lion's canine tooth that was about four inches long. It's a beautiful, gorgeous sea lion's canine tooth, and she went home with. Uh, most of the kids find a couple dozen different teeth. It's more important for me that, to explain that they're going to find a diversity of, of group of, of things. They might find 12 different types of shark, whereas some of the other places you might go, like uh, um, you go to the places where they split the, you know, like tourmaline, you know, you're looking for like tourmaline or you're looking for certain minerals at different quarries and stuff and you go home with those things. Here you, you go home with a dozen different animals, maybe more. So it's kind of kind of neat. You got a large diversity of stuff you can find and there are people who are always welcome, you know, you know, welcome to take them the material home with them and do the thing where you spread it out in the dish and look real close. Yeah, with a microscope. Yep. So cool. And then I was reading on your website about, you know, bringing families up here and bringing school groups and you said you're pretty much guaranteed to find something. Well, yeah, they're all over the place. And most of the most of the we you know, time the first thing you're going to find are bones. I mean, we have literally about five times as many bones as you do shark's teeth. It was just, the you know, bones were just so numerous and most people don't want the bones. So they just toss them down and they take the shark's teeth. So there's bones everywhere. Yeah. And uh, well, the cool thing about the bones, and I try to tell this people, take some of the bones home and you clean them up real close and you look real close at them and you'll see signs of feeding damage. Almost all these animals were being eaten and you can see gnaw marks and scrapes and it's pretty sad. <laughs> oh, but the kids love it because oh, it's yeah, fascinating. Oh that, yeah, that's great kid stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of hard for the adults. You're like, oh, well, it's a little violent out here. It is. It was, a, it was definitely a, a savanna, like a killing floor savanna, yes. right? Where you had predators, yeah. you know, dealing and taking out, uh, you know, prey. And when I think about shark's teeth, you think about, you know, the tchotchkes you get on the coast that, you know, maybe half an inch big. Mm -hmm. But some of the ones you showed me, you just pick up and they're teeny tiny baby shark's teeth. Where are those from? Well, there's so many of the smaller sharks that were up here, the little, you know, the little tiny, all these tiny requiem sharks and lemon sharks and stuff. You know, when they're, when they're four or five feet long and they're giving birth to little baby sharks, those baby sharks have hundreds of fully formed teeth and they're ready to feed. They come out, they're swimming around, ready to eat something immediately. There's no training involved. Well, inevitably the bigger brother or sister would munch down on the, the younger brothers or sisters. So biggest sibling eats the smaller siblings. That's kind of the way it would go, sometimes in the womb. Okay. It's sad, right? But, but what ends up happening is, and then oftentimes you get those four foot sharks that are pregnant, that, that have babies inside them that will also be eaten or die. So what you end up with is you end up with all those baby sharks and all those baby tiny teeth being dispersed everywhere. So you end up with embryonic shark's teeth up here by the millions. They're all over the place. And you can't take a screen really and screen them. They just go right through the screen and they're in this, you know, silt. So what you do is you just get this material, you take it by the buckets and you can spread it out in dishes and get a magnifying glass and a pair of tweezers and just continue to pull out shark's teeth. They're so small, they look like grains of sand to your eyes. And then all of a sudden you're like, no, that's a shark's tooth. So, we, so cool. And I know that 2020 and now it's looking like 2021 are weird years. You're still doing some weekend social distance tours. Once things get a little back closer to normal, what should parents and teachers know about coming up here? Um, you're going to get dusty. And um, the one question I get every time is about valley fever. And honestly, we've had about 10,000 people up here in 12 years and about two have caught valley fever. And there's no guarantee that they caught it here. They could have caught it at the AM, PM, you know, on the way into town. The thing is, is that we had uh, Dr. Um, Lauer, who's the uh, microbiology professor out at CSUB, she came out and did a study. And she, she took five samples from our area, but she did a study in the entire southern San Joaquin Valley. And one of the things she did along with her study while she was looking for ciamitis, the fungus that causes valley fever, she also did a soil analysis at each of the, dig of the locations she took samples from. And she did this over an 18 month period to get different rainy seasons. And what she determined was is that um, 
the, the fungus that causes valley fever needs a certain a certain makeup of ground material to funk to actually grow. So it needs you know a certain amount of clay, a certain amount of silt, a certain amount of sand, a, you know a, a, a perfect constituent of of dirt for it to, to grow. And up in this area, it's just far too silty. So because this material has been being gone through and looked through and, and material has been displaced and this was once a seafloor that was almost 100% silt, it's been deposited in all these hills, we don't really find patches of that fungus in this area. It doesn't mean you can't go to the hill next door to the top soil over there and go dig around over there. If there was excavation, you might get it, but that can happen anywhere on the valley floor. So that's the biggest thing is it's just like not to worry about, you know, uh, valley fever up here. Um, we've had the most recent science that says it's not here. And then also um, you be prepared to get hot and sweaty and, and there's some work involved. And the other thing is, is it's not it's not like Indiana Jones where it's like you have a two hour movie. And at the end of the two hour movie, you're going to find your megalodon. I've had people coming up here for decades and not found a megalodon. I had a. Unfortunately, I had a, 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 a dad with a nine-year-old boy come up here uh, about five weeks ago and they wrote a bad review because after they spent two hours and 10 minutes here and the nine-year-old didn't find his megalodon and they went home and wrote this bad review about how they expected to find a megalodon and well, the megalodon teeth here are not scientifically, you know, special and but they're few and far between so they're a very sought after tooth and the teeth that come out up here are almost they're pristine. They have all the serrations on them. They look exactly like they did when they came out of the animal's mouth. So they, they fetch a high price if you were to sell them online. I would never recommend selling them because you, if you find your megalodon up here, it's like finding something that no one ever gets to find. So you might as well keep it. But if you did find a nice one up here, it could fetch $1,500 to $2,000 online. And I thought it was just kind of unrealistic that if I charge $30 for a nine-year-old child to come up here and find a bunch of shark's teeth, that they had expectations to find a $1,500 shark's tooth to go home and uh, you know they had the so come up here with an open mind of I want to find hundreds of different animals you find all the different little you know teeth from different you know from sting from rays to, to different size sharks to the big sharks to but all the marine mammals the whales the sea lions we find dolphin teeth up here every week little dolphin teeth porpoise teeth uh, different fish vertebrae turtle shell we find turtle sea turtle all the time up here. So it's really more about coming and being able to have a nice, you know, outdoor activity and getting to find tons of different uh, species. The diversity here is just incredible. Perfect, and enjoying the science and the history of it all. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, I think one of my last questions is, uh, tell us a little bit about your dad and his love for the fossils and kind of this legacy you're living on for him. Well, he, uh, He'd always been a bit of an amateur paleontologist. You know, he'd always liked to dig up, but he was also very outdoorsy type of, you know, the fishing. He worked with, he was a, worked with the California Fish and Game for quite a long period of time. I believe he was the treasurer for a few years as well, or he worked within the organization. He was an avid uh, hunter, fisherman, um, all kinds, you know, all, all outdoorsy kind of activity. But when he finally retired in the late 80s, you know, around 90, 91, he, he decided that this is really kind of what he wanted to, to focus on. So he still, I mean, he still would be gone for weeks at a time going on a fishing trip or something. But, but for this, for the most part, this is, he would be up here, you know, crack a dawn and stay till as long as he could finding fossils and, and uh, supplying different uh, uh, gem and mineral uh, uh, areas like you can go to any gem and mineral shop and you might find a tooth from this area and my dad was supplying those kinds of things but also at the same time anytime he would discover a skeleton of some type he would actually you know either get it and collect it and put it in our local museum or have somebody else come and do it he would find you know uh, 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 loose teeth and such and then he he had so many loose teeth that he, he, he you know he would get rid of them uh, not necessarily have them, and that was part of the way he supported himself in his retirement. But then, anytime they would find a skeleton of some kind, he'd get a local our local museum. You know, we'd work with the the Buena Vista Museum, bring them up here, and and he'd either go to them or he would work with a different other institution. He had um, the last skeleton we brought up here. We pulled out before he when he passed away. We were he was working with the San Diego Museum of Natural History, and uh, down there was Dr. Tom Demery. And uh, he brought him up here and they pulled out a, a, a small baleen whale over there on the other side of the property. 
and um, they'd actually done all the major work on it and they had they had jacketed they hadn't brought it out yet on a truck and then he passed away and two weeks after he had passed away we had to bring the san diego museum up post posthumously posthumously and for them to actually bring re retrieve that specimen and take it down to the san diego museum prior to that he had had quite a bit of work with them um, there's actually a spot up there, you know, up higher where we call you know, Whale Quarry. That was the original property that my that my father bought. He there's a cut that runs through the hillside up there that we call Turtle Alley, and they pulled out two entire leatherback turtles out of that spot. And one's on display at the San Diego Museum. So go to Balboa Park and you go to the big NHM Museum. Right in there, as you walk in, there's a leatherback turtle on display, and that came out up there where those trailers are up higher. Um, I do believe that the down at our local museum, there's a skull a turtle skull that's down there in the Buena Vista Museum, and that came out of there as well. Um, but there's, by the time he died, there was, I believe, 14 skeletons housed worldwide. I think five or six down at our local museum, but then another uh, nine somewhere spread out all over, I think as far as Yokohama, Japan, and the Netherlands has some material. That's so cool. So right here all, from all, all our over. backyard. Yeah, right in the backyard. Yeah. The the. The, the thing about it being in our backyard, unfortunately, is that, is that like when you go to the Los Angeles County Museum and you, you don't see a lot of this material on display because it's, you know, you go down in there and there's dinosaurs, right? That's what, that's what the paying public will want to go see. So they have dinosaur exhibits. And uh, I was, you know, I, I go down there and, 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 and you get to go up to the top floors where they do all the prep work and that the, the general public doesn't get to go to. And it's like, They'll say, hey, let's look at your Sharktooth Hill collection. And then they have it all up there. And you open up these big, massive uh, file cabinet drawers that open up. And you walk down and you pull out these trays. And you look down and they have wonderful skulls and specimens and stuff. But none of it really gets down into rotation. Because it's just not something the public is interested in. I mean, these are small 15 million year old whales. When they can see real whales, you can just go to Santa Monica, you know, and, or, you know, and go out there and actually go whale watching. So, and these wells in today's oceans are much larger and, you know, and, 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 and you know, wonderful things, specimens. And these wells were fairly small and uh, primitive in many ways, but we had big sharks, right? Yeah. And that's the fascination. I also wanted to ask a little bit more about the Discovery Shark Show. What did they feature when they were out here? Up there where those trailers are, um, when my dad had passed away, um, my stepmother, had decided that we needed to liquidate some of the property to pay off some of the, the through the estate. And so we partnered with, um, we, we retained um, mineral rights up there, but um, uh, sold the surface rights up there to a couple named Sean and Lisa Towhill. And they discovered a well that was missing a head. So we discovered this well and uh, thought, well, okay, great, we got a whole well here. And we went into the hell, and, uh, and, to, and there was no head. But we found a couple of meg, they found a couple of meg teeth in the area. Oh, cool. So the Discovery Channel got word and said, hey, we're going to turn this into a Miocene murder mystery. Yeah. And they investigated this skeleton and uh, where the meg teeth were. And then they got the Mythbusters build crew, um, uh, Carrie, you know, Carrie Byron and, Cor and Tori and, and, and Grant. In Mahara, and they set them up over in Ventura. And what they did was they had they had a, a mechanical engineer build a megalodon jaw that was made out of metal. And then they they what they wanted to do was the build the MythBusters build crew built an analog of a whale, and they wanted to see if the bite force would be enough to take off the head of a whale. So they they did that all over there, at, in, you know, in, in Ventura, and it was a wonderful line of little show. It's called Sharkzilla. And it's on the Discovery Channel. It aired maybe five, six years ago, but they replay it every year during Shark Week. And you can find it online uh, as well. Um, you want to know the real truth about that story, though? Yes. Because you know how, you know, I don't, but I don't want to say television lies. Television has some fun. You said it was a, a Tele docu-series, not a documentary. Yes. Te television has some fun. So <laughs> um, when that, that body was discovered the, from the tail section on and it got up to where we were going to find the skull, went to uncover it and there's no skull, but there was a car tire there. Oh. So somebody had literally found that head from the other direction a long time ago and it marked the location. It had come out with a car tire saying, okay, we think there's more there. We'll mark it with a, it had somehow got reburied. And then this, the couple that we had sold that property to had found the tail end of that skull and went there and they thought they were getting the whole thing. 
and they did find a meg tooth there that was all legitimate in the whole bit but the 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 people that you know produced that show decided well let's just omit the car tire portion and think that a megalodon took that head did they ever say for sure though that this happened or they were saying what if what if okay. it's always it was always a what if but it was a but it was a it was taking a a um, a, a hypothetical conjecture all the way to its farthest extreme by getting the Mythbusters crew to build an analog and the mechanical jaw and the, the whole thing. Right. And uh, so. and it worked because I remember seeing the promo. I never got to check out the show and now I want to go watch it. Yes, finally, just for teachers and parents who are watching this, all the students watching and enjoying the history and the science here, what's some of the last things that we didn't touch on you want to make sure they know? Well. I've got obviously a lot of material up here and if you if you can't seem to make it up here bring kids you know because of covid-19 or anything just I'm going to we'll we'll have the contact information for you to get it they can contact me and I can get them buckets of this material they can spread it out for their students or they can just do for themselves they can spread it out and then zoom a, a you know a call with their students or something and actually show them what can be pulled out of the material so any teachers out there that want some of the material, just contact me and I can get them. I can also, I've got a little fossil finding guide that um, we can supply as a PDF file that they can download also and um, either send it to their kids or print it out and um, still be able to do some little, little bit of nice paleontological instruction at home during this period. I love it. Hands-on learning is the best. Yep. All right. Thank you so much. That You're was really welcome. exciting. Thank you.